Okay, hello, welcome to ICFP. So I'm the program chair, Eijiro Sumi. And the first session is a keynote, invited keynote talk by Monty Abadi. So let me introduce Martin uh, for a few minutes. So he uh, received his PhD at Stanford University in 1987. And he has been working on security and programming languages. And uh, he taught in uh, many places, like, like uh, UC Berkeley and Stanford University, and UC Santa Cruz, uh, where he has the position of a uh, professor emeritus now. And he's now a principal scientist at Google, and he's going to talk about TensorFlow. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for this kind invitation. So uh, this morning, I will be talking about TensorFlow, which is a software platform for machine learning. TensorFlow has particularly strong support for a kind of machine learning that is called deep learning. So I will start this talk by reviewing deep learning and giving you a little bit of perspective on this field. Then I will present TensorFlow, both its basic computational model and uh, some elements of its implementation. And I will get into at least one advanced topic namely the design and implementation of control flow constructs such as conditionals and iteration. Uh, throughout, I hope to offer some thoughts on how um, all of this deep learning TensorFlow relate to functional programming, but also about some intriguing aspects that do not quite fit into traditional functional programming. And as an example of this last point, and also as an example of the flexibility of TensorFlow, and frankly, also because I've been working on it recently, and I think it's quite exciting and fun, I will tell you about an application to learning how to communicate securely, something that we have been calling neural cryptography, and that will be fairly brief and uh, near the end. I am a member of the Google Brain team, which is um, a research team within the Google Research Organization that uh, focuses on machine learning and infrastructure for deep learning. And TensorFlow uh, is, uh, of course, uh, a big part of this. Uh, this uh, work is in collaboration with uh, many, many people in Google Brain and other parts of Google and uh, also outside Google. I'd like to particularly mention uh, Jeff Dean, who leads Google Brain, and uh, Yuan Yu, who has been driving the work on control flow, and Dave Anderson, who's a professor in CMU who is visiting us and with whom I have been doing this work on neural cryptography. So as I said, deep learning is a particular kind of machine learning. It's a very powerful approach that applies to many kinds of data, um, speech, text, images, and more, um, and many kinds of uh, problems. As an illustration of this pro point, the images on this slide correspond to three applications of deep learning, by no means the, the only ones and perhaps not the most important ones. The one on the left is for a classification task to which I'll return later in the talk. It is the task of classifying cucumbers according to their shape and color, among other attributes. Um, the one in the center is for the game of Go, uh, and it refers to the AlphaGo program, which used deep learning to great effect uh, in recent very high-profile matches. Finally, the one on the right uses, uh, is a use of deep learning for generating fake uh, kanji characters. <laughs> so as you can see, uh, deep learning is not only uh, great at understanding data and classifying uh, data, images, or other kinds of data, but is also very good at evaluating situations, at uh, inventing strategies, and also at creating, at generating content, content that uh, is uh, sometimes realistic and sometimes uh, can even be beautiful. Deep learning is not uh, a new idea, but it's an idea that's worked well only relatively recently, in part because of improvements in algorithms and techniques, but also in part because of uh, better big data sets and uh, better software and hardware platforms on which to run the machine learning models. As an illustration of this, uh, this graph shows you the number of file system directories that contain deep model, model descriptions uh, files at Google. Um, and you can see uh, the use of deep learning at Google has been exploding 
And these directories are for Google applications across many different domains to deal with uh, text, speech, images, and more. Deep learning is based on neural networks, which are loosely inspired by the brain. At their core, neural networks are built from simple trainable functions. Here, trainable means that the functions are parameterized and that there is a process called training or learning by which we choose good values for uh, the parameters uh, in order to obtain uh, a model that will later be used during inference in the real world. The most basic element, or at least one of the most basic elements in neural network is an individual neuron. Uh, this is a function that takes some number of floating point inputs and produces a floating point output by taking an unaffined combination of the inputs and then passing the result of that through some function f. The coefficients of the inputs are called weights. Uh, the additive term b is called a bias. And the function through which they're passed is function f is a differentiable nonlinear function. I put differentiable between quotation marks because, in fact, in practice, uh, the functions being used are sometimes not differentiable. They're just mostly differentiable, differentiable almost everywhere, or approximations to that. So for example, uh, f may be such that f of x is the maximum of 0 and x. So that's piecewise differentiable. This is what's called a rectified linear unit, or ReLU, which is a very common term uh, in this field. These uh, basic neurons are assembled into absolutely gigantic uh, networks with uh, many, many uh, neurons uh, organized in many, many layers. Uh, the image at the top is that of a very recent network that was published just a few weeks ago called the Inception ResNet V2 network. And uh, each of the bubbles there represents not just uh, one neuron, but a whole group of neurons, for example, a fully connected layer of neurons. The image at the bottom is a compressed view of the same network where repeated elements are shown only once together with a factor of repetition. And as you can see, uh, a network like this uh, has uh, hundreds of uh, layers of depth. These networks are uh, amazingly successful uh, in this particular case at uh, image classification tasks. Uh, a very typical thing is to use them for uh, the ImageNet challenge in which uh, one is interested in millions of uh, labeled images. Uh, 15 million is the size of the standard data set that belong to uh, about 22,000 uh, classes. And the challenge is to put images into the correct classes. How does one train such a system? How does one find good values for the parameters that make it be successful at classifying images or whatever else it's intended to do? One approach, uh, which is called supervised learning, is to um, gather somehow uh, a lot of uh, training examples, pairs of inputs and desired outputs, and to try to find values for the parameters that correspond to those known input-output pairs. Um, and this is done um, simply by iterating over all of these examples. Uh, while not done, one picks a training example x, y, runs the neural network forward on the input x, compares the actual output of the neural network to the desired output y. And if they're not equal, one adjusts the parameters of the neural network in order to reduce uh, the error, to reduce the loss of the neural network. The adjustment of the parameters can be done in several different ways, but a very popular successful one is simply gradient descent of the kind that you may remember from calculus. Um, basically, one computes partial derivatives of the loss function along the paths in the neural network, and then one follows the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters in the direction that will uh, lead to the smaller uh, error. Mathematically, this is uh, fairly simple. In practice, uh, it's uh, something that is done at scale uh, for very long periods of time on many machines. It's not uncommon for uh, gradient descent to run for several hours or several days across many machines. We can already see and highlight 
some interesting properties of uh, deep learning, some attractive properties. One is that it's clearly applicable across uh, many domains, relying on what seems like a very simple, very fundamental conceptual core. Uh, this conceptual core is uh, based on uh, functional applications, just like functional programming, and on composition of uh, very basic functions, just like functional programming. And uh, whenever one composes two functions, f and g, there is some intermediate representation for the data that is the output of f and the input to g. And uh, in deep learning, those intermediate representations are quite uh, intriguing and uh, worthy of study. Just like in functional programming too, occasionally there is a need for state and other things that don't fit quite so neatly into the basic paradigm. And uh, that can be interesting too, as we will see later in the talk. Some other attractive properties of deep learning are that it can benefit from having a lot of data. It is not uncommon for the training data sets to contain millions of examples, as in the ImageNet case. And often the data requires very little data curation. It is not uh, typically required that humans spend a lot of time selecting the interesting features of the data or removing inconsistencies from the data. The neural networks typically do a great job of extracting signal from the data anyway. Uh, finally, um, machine learning with neural networks requires some architectural choices. When one uh, invents a network like this inception ResNet v2, one needs to decide uh, how many layers to put in and roughly the shape of the network. Uh, but one does not get into the delicate business of designing particular algorithms and data structures for the network to do its job. Imagine you were writing a program for classifying cucumbers or for distinguishing cats from dogs. There might be some subroutine of your program that is trying to look at the texture uh, of uh, the image or trying to find its contour, or there might be a data structure that holds the legs of the animal that you're trying to analyze. In neural networks, you don't have to do any of that. You throw the picture at it and something comes out at the other end. Perhaps internally, it has figured out that counting legs is a very important thing to do to distinguish some animals from some other animals. But that is not something that the programmer needs to decide explicitly. Neural network, uh, although is based on composition of functions uh, for defining the networks, uh, the, relies on end-to-end uh, -end training to great effect uh, in many cases. Imagine, for example, that you have to build a neural network for driving a car. Uh, one way to do it might be to decompose the task into having a neural network to look at the road, another one to recognize pedestrians, another one to decide when it is good to apply the brakes, and so on. A different approach um, that uh, some people from uh, NVIDIA just um, published uh, in the last uh, few months is to drive the car entirely end-to-end, -end, directly from perception to action. You have a camera pointed at the road, and then uh, magic happens, and the neural network decides in which direction to turn the wheel. The network had 27 million connections and about 250,000 parameters, so quite a, a large network. In this context, uh, correctness uh, is uh, sometimes uh, tenuous, let's say. Uh, if uh, the neural network might have numerical errors inside or if the training procedure has race conditions, maybe that's not so important as long as the neural network trains correctly end-to-end -end and minimizes its uh, loss. Uh, equally, um, there isn't very much compositionality in this way of doing the training. And uh, any time one needs to move to a new task, one needs to retrain from scratch uh, end to end. So I think that compositionality and correctness uh, are important and may currently be a little bit underrated. I expect that compositionality will matter more and more in understanding uh, neural networks, in controlling them, in predicting their behavior, and perhaps in repurposing them for new tasks for which they were not originally trained. Although deep learning has been around for um, a couple of decades, uh, it's still a very young discipline and it's still somewhat ad hoc uh, in some uh, respects, somewhat unsettled. Um, we can say at this point that it seems to be mostly some sort of functional programming or program synthesis. 
uh, but how it fits with other kinds of programming or program synthesis and even with the rest of computing uh, seems open to debate. I think it's uh, intriguing and I think it's also important. Uh, and uh, indeed there is research in a variety of directions that aim to explore the interface between deep learning uh, and uh, familiar other provinces of computing. For example, there is work on enhancing neural networks with unbounded auxiliary data structures. For example, something called the neural Turing machines uh, have access to random access memory. Um, there is also work on neural networks that can use little databases, a project called the Neural Programmer, in which a neural network can query tables in order to come up with answers. Um, querying tables is not differentiable, but there are tricks for getting around that. More generally, there is uh, various techniques for incorporating non-differentiable components into the world of neural networks. And a very big hammer in that is what is known as reinforcement learning, which is what was used, for example, for AlphaGo. Uh, finally, one might imagine uh, being interested in a world of deep learning with more types. Uh, everything I showed you so far is functions from floating point numbers to floating point numbers. But uh, what about other types of data? Um, do they uh, deserve to have uh, more abstract representations? Or perhaps we want to have types for some of the learned representations in intermediate layers of neural networks. Finally, uh, the explanations of uh, the universality of neural networks are uh, satisfying as far as they go. They basically relate neural networks to Turing machines, but they're still somewhat limited. They don't give a very good account of uh, why the training process works as wonderfully as it does in practice. So uh, all of this uh, stands in contrast with the situation in functional programming for which many questions like this uh, have largely been settled for quite some time. And uh, it is possible that the connections between uh, machine learning and functional programming will be fruitful in starting to address these questions for machine learning. So that's uh, all I wanted to say about deep learning in general. Uh, now I'd like to move on to telling you about uh, TensorFlow, which is uh, our software platform for uh, deep learning. It's been under development for a couple of years, and it was uh, released uh, open source last November, November 2015, under an Apache license. In um, creating TensorFlow, uh, we were trying to uh, enable concise, clear representations of the intent of programmers that can be compiled into efficient machine-specific code, but with a programmer safety protected by powerful abstractions. And we also wanted modularity, both at the level of systems code and at the level of the machine learning models. And we're achieving some of that with some of the high-level APIs uh, for TensorFlow, but there's potentially more to do. Our main goals were flexibility along many dimensions and performance and scalability. We wanted to have the flexibility to use the very same platform for training your own networks and for using them after they have been trained, what is called uh, inference. We want to be able to use the platform for doing very experimental research where we might, for example, uh, not use gradient descent or use some exotic variant of gradient descent in combination with something else or use very different network architectures and also be able to use it at scale reliably uh, in production. And uh, we want to be able to support many approaches, including unforeseen ones, on a variety of diverse uh, platforms without uh, requiring uh, any uh, specific hardware and software underneath us. Uh, of course, we wanted performance, but we also wanted scalability. We wanted it to be the case that if an experiment takes uh, a day on your GPU, uh, but you have available to you a few dozen GPU, you should be able to do the same experiment uh, over lunch, um, taking advantage of those extra GPUs. And the key to this is uh, model parallelism and data parallelism, splitting these uh, neural networks uh, into several different parts to run on different machines and running different replicas of a neural network across different machines. We also wanted to be able to take advantage of especially efficient hardware. Uh, platform heterogeneity, the specialization of hardware for certain workloads is important and seems likely to be increasingly important in the future. 
For example, we have at our disposal something that we call a tensor processing unit, or TPU. This is a special purpose custom machine learning ASIC that uh, we use for TensorFlow. Uh, it's been in production for over 16 months now, and it's being used at Google for every search query. It was used for the AlphaGo match, and it has a variety of other applications. So uh, under TensorFlow, then, we have CPUs, GPUs, DSTPUs, and perhaps other kinds of hardware yet to be uh, invented, or you can bring your own. Uh, on top of that, uh, we have the core TensorFlow execution system on which I'll spend uh, most of uh, the remainder of the talk. And on top of that, we have uh, various uh, front ends that uh, enable specifying and driving computation. The core execution system is written in C++ for performance. The front ends are specific to particular languages. At the moment, we have the most invested into a C++ and a Python front end, but it's fairly easy to develop some other ones, and some are indeed under development. So for example, in the Python API, uh, one can both define graphs that represent neural networks and drive the computation with those graphs. So at the top, we have uh, a simple graph in which uh, y is obtained by uh, multiplying the input x by the weights w and adding b to them, and then running that through a, a ReLU. Uh, x uh, there is not a concrete input. It's a placeholder that will be replaced by a concrete input uh, later on. And uh, once this graph has been contracted, we can run a session uh, using this graph by feeding a concrete value of x and fetching the value of y. Given a graph, we can specify uh, some set of inputs for a part of the graph, some set of outputs. The graph is automatically trimmed to be only the part that is relevant for those inputs and those outputs. And then uh, that subgraph uh, is run for the particular values of the inputs. This uh, API and the other APIs basically define uh, data flow graphs to which uh, we map our abstract idea of uh, neural networks. Um, and the job of the core uh, execution engine of TensorFlow is to perform data flow computations. The nodes in the data flow graph are operations or ops. The data are tensors, which are uh, n-dimensional arrays. In the implementation, the n-dimensional arrays that we use are all uh, dense. We represent sparse arrays in terms of uh, dense ones. The semantics of this data flow computation is uh, very, very simple. It's just like uh, evaluation of expressions in many programming languages. And in particular, it does not require uh, talking about streams uh, or other such complicated things that sometimes appear in data flow computing. Uh, we think of uh, edges as holding uh, one or zero tensors at any point in time. When uh, all of the inputs of a node are ready, the node may consume its inputs and produce an output. And after firing, the, non the node is uh, done, it's completed. And the computation of the graph ends when all the data has been drained from the graph. And this very simple model of essentially expression evaluation uh, extends to other features, control edges, which I'll show you in a little while, uh, state, uh, conditionals, loops, and more. Though, of course, in some cases, uh, it needs to be generalized a little bit. This uh, graph for data flow computation, of course, represents the neural network's forward function going, for example, from an image of uh, a cat or a dog to the label cat or dog. But it can also represent, and it typically also represents, the backward pass, namely uh, the computation of the gradients of the loss function. So the same graph supports uh, training. This uh, gradient code is generated automatically by a kind of automatic differentiation from the forward pass. So the programmer does not have to do the differentiation themselves. That's provided to them. 
the uh, parameters, biases, and weights are uh, variables. And uh, some operations in the graph are in charge of uh, updating those variables in the course of gradient descent or whatever other optimization algorithm you choose to use. Of course, there are several ways of incorporating state in a system like TensorFlow, just like in functional languages. Invariably, incorporating state will violate some of the properties of the system without state. One thing that probably would not work very well is to pretend that the only state of interest are the gradients and the only state updates are updates to gradients and to force these state updates to be threaded sequentially by some kind of function composition. Uh, first, because it would preclude other uses of state. For example, we might want to use state for logging or we might want to use state for other machine learning bits of interesting stuff like momentum. Um, and uh, it will also complicate experimenting with the synchronous training and other variants that are attractive to machine learning researchers. The particular way we choose to incorporate state into TensorFlow gives us a huge amount of flexibility. Uh, it's possible that more disciplined ways of incorporating st state, maybe ones from the literature on functional programming and data flow computation, uh, will be worth considering in the future as uh, the system matures. The same graphs can be run on uh, a single machine uh, on one device or be spread across uh, multiple devices and multiple machines. For example, uh, this graph has a part, the yellow part, running on a GPU and a blue part running on a CPU. And this implies very minimal changes to the single device model. Uh, TensorFlow uh, automatically inserts little nodes at the boundaries between devices, pairs of send and receive nodes that transport tensors across the devices using the appropriate communication mechanisms. The receive operations pull data from the send operations and feed the data to the other nodes uh, on their same devices. And communication across machines is abstra abstracted just like cross-device communication within a machine, though of course it may rely on a very different transport, again with very minimal changes to the single device model. This um, approach leads uh, very easily to supporting both data parallelism and model parallelism. We allow graphs to be split across several devices, uh, and uh, many graph replicas can process uh, separate parts of the input or different inputs uh, in parallel. And this is the key or one key to the scalability of uh, TensorFlow. Now, variables that hold shared state, such as weights and biases, can reside on the same devices as uh, other non-trivial graphs. These in contrast to some other approaches to building systems like this, in which um, dedicated uh, devices serve as parameter servers and are in charge of managing uh, all the shared state. Um, so here we can have quite uh, non-trivial subgraphs that are next to the state that we're managing and that do interesting things for the state updates. For example, they might uh, implement uh, interesting optimizations or uh, they might be enforcing some particular synchronization regime. Uh, in particular, when multiple replicas want to uh, update the same parameters, these uh, graphs next to the parameters can enforce uh, either synchronous or, or asynchronous updating disciplines. Uh, synchronous updating really amounts to having a larger batch size. Uh, synchronous updating uh, has the effect of making fault tolerance a little bit more complicated, so one may want a hybrid in which we doesn't, one doesn't work for all the replicas. Um, in any case, uh, there's a variety of uh, other considerations in deciding whether to go with synchronous or asynchronous update is, for example, the uh, freshness of the uh, parameters and the noise ingredients. In designing TensorFlow, we didn't want to take a position on whether one should be asynchronous or synchronous. Instead, we wanted to provide a general platform that allowed machine learning researchers to experiment with both kinds uh, of updates, 
since both are popular and interesting at the moment. In addition to dependencies uh, implied by the flow of data in these data flow graphs, we allow uh, additional uh, ordering to be imposed by including control edges between nodes. Uh, these control edges uh, have a semantic effect because we have a state they can have the uh, effect of ordering reads and writes. They're also very important for performance. Uh, sometimes we can tell looking at the graph that some parts of the graph have no chance of being useful before other parts have done their job. And we can uh, manually, if we want, or using tools, insert control edges to constrain the ordering in order to make more efficient use of resources. For example, uh, in this graph, um, the receive node uh, that fits into the multiplication has no chance of being very useful before the other two receive nodes further to the left have received their data. Uh, in order to preserve bandwidth, uh, we introduce uh, control edges between the receive nodes to make sure that the one further to the right doesn't fire before the ones to the left have uh, gotten their data. And this is done automatically by doing a critical path analysis on the graph that tells us when it may make sense to run certain operations. So uh, in what I told you so far, uh, every node in the graph executes and executes uh, exactly uh, once. Uh, sometimes, however, it makes sense to have conditional execution where some nodes execute only some of the time or to have uh, iterative execution in which some nodes uh, Go, go over a sequence of inputs, for example. Uh, in particular, recursive neural networks, RNNs, are very important. They're widely used for speech recognition, for modeling languages, for translation, for captioning images, and more. A special case of RNNs are LSTMs, long short-term memory networks, which are very good at learning long-term dependencies in sequences, for example, in sentences. Uh, these uh, RNNs have uh, feedback, and they can be neatly represented with a very simple while loop. Uh, so we would like to be able to support this directly in TensorFlow without forcing the programmers to unroll their uh, while loops. So we wanted to have an approach to incorporating loops and conditionals that fit well in the data flow model that enable parallel execution and distributed execution, sometimes of different iterations of the same loop. And we also wanted to have the automatic generation of gradient code, just like for models that don't use the control flow constructs. And uh, for this, we followed an approach that dates back to mid 80s to the work of Arvind and his colleague on something that they called dynamic data flow architectures. Um, they add special operations to graph that enable them to do conditionals and uh, control flow. Uh, as uh, you will see, we could base quite a lot of our work uh, on theirs, uh, though we had to add uh, some uh, extra bells and whistles and some non-trivial uh, technical development, for example, to do with the gradient code, which was not a concern for them. So. Um, in particular, they add two new operations, uh, switch and merge. Switch takes uh, an input that is a tensor, an input that is a Boolean, and forwards the tensor on the left or the right, depending on the value of the Boolean. Conceptually, you might think it doesn't forward anything on the other output. Uh, in fact, in our implementation, it forwards uh, a signal that says nothing more is going to happen on this side, a kind of dead signal which is useful for uh, other nodes downstream knowing that they're not going to be receiving anything. The merge, on the other hand, receives two inputs. Uh, one of them will typically be dead, the other one will contain the tensor, and it forwards the tensor. The nodes for uh, iteration are a little bit more complicated. They're based on the notion of execution context, which uh, is a way of identifying different invocations of the same node. And uh, the operations for control flow 
are ways of manipulating this context, uh, entering loops, exiting loops, and uh, going to the next iteration. For example, suppose that we have a while loop that uh, starts with an input 0 and increments it by 1 until the input reaches 10. Um, it's represented by this uh, little graph. We enter the loop through an enter node. Uh, L is a name for uh, the loop. It's just a string label. Um, we exit through the uh, exit node at the top. And every time around the loop, we go through a merge and switch that uh, deal with the conditional structure of the loop. And we go through next iteration to uh, increment the iteration count. Note that this is a purely functional loop. We're just iterating. We're not updating uh, any bit of uh, shared state. Uh, very briefly, uh, how do we compute gradients for control flow constructs? So intuitively, if you had um, a Boolean, if B, then C1, L, C2, the gradient of that should be the gradient of C1 if B is true and the gradient of C2 is B is false. But statically, ahead of time, we do not know if B is going to be true or not. Otherwise, we wouldn't have needed the conditional. So uh, what we do is we write the gradient code itself with a conditional. The gradient will be if B, then gradient of C1, else gradient of C2. The same goes for uh, while loops. We don't know how often the while loop is going to run. So we need another loop that counts up the right number of iterations and takes the gradient uh, of the body of the loop. For doing the gradient of the loop, we use the chain rule from calculus. For example, if the gradient of the body, the, if, excuse me, if the body uh, represents a function g, the gradient of g to the power 3 applied to x is g prime of x times g prime of g of x times g prime of g square of x. In both cases, we do this only for uh, graphs generated from high-level programs with conditionals and uh, while loops. We don't do it for arbitrary graphs that may contain merge, switch, enter, exit, and next iteration. And indeed, gradients might not be well-defined for arbitrary such graphs. One uh, implementation difficulty of all of this is that the gradient computation needs to reuse information from the forward computation of the function. Uh, in the case of the conditional, we need to remember which branch was taken. In the case of the loop, we need to remember how many times we went around the loop. But there is even more than that. If you look at G3 prime, you can see that it uses G of X and G square of X. So we need to remember some of the intermediate values of the forward computation. And uh, doing this in a space efficient manner uh, is uh, quite uh, challenging and uh, a place where uh, we had to work quite hard and where more work might make sense. These loops uh, can also be spread across many devices. And uh, it's uh, similar to what we do for spreading any kind of graph. We uh, add send and receive uh, nodes. However, this doesn't quite work because uh, in this case, the device B, which is participating in the loop, has no way of telling when a new iteration starts and it should be pulling some new data or when the loop has completed entirely and it's time to reclaim resources. In order to provide this information at B, we enhance it with um, a little um, loop uh, of its own, a little control state machine that uh, keeps track of uh, whether the loop is running and when it goes to the next uh, iteration. This requires no changes to the rest of the system, in particular to the local executor at each of the devices. And the communication cost is just one tiny message per iteration from the device that turns the loop to the other devices that participate in the loop. And then we can partition the With grant some. and receive operations. So uh, th there is, uh, of course, a lot more to TensorFlow than I had time to uh, tell you so far. Uh, there is more work going on in front ends and APIs, uh, work on supporting diverse approaches to learning, uh, more work that we're doing and we might like to do on developing the core programming models. 
uh, in the handling of state, in the handling of tensor shapes, and more. And finally, there is always room for more optimization by graph rewriting, by doing automatic placement, by doing better scheduling decisions. Uh, finally, uh, doing an open source release, as you may imagine, uh, is uh, quite a bit of work, but it's uh, rewarding work. And uh, we had a pretty successful uh, release with very strong adoption. This graph represents um, the number of stars and forks on GitHub of uh, TensorFlow in comparison with some other popular machine learning tools. Uh, although TensorFlow was released uh, only in, in late uh, November, uh, it um, did well quite quickly. Uh, surprisingly, it was the most fork repository on GitHub in 2015, although it was released very much near the end of the year. And uh, after this release, TensorFlow had a number of applications, a number of uh, uh, users. Some of them were some of the expected ones. Uh, some were uh, interesting and to us a little bit surprising. We had users that we had not uh, foreseen, and that's, of course, uh, very encouraging and very nice. Um, the gentleman at the center of this picture, his name is Makoto Koike, is one of our unexpected users. Here he's in the family farm uh, where they plant cucumbers with uh, his parents. And he picked up uh, TensorFlow and uh, built himself uh, a little cucumber sorting machine. Apparently, the farm uh, needs to categorize the cucumbers into nine categories according to uh, their various uh, attributes like uh, shape uh, and color. And uh, using uh, TensorFlow and a little camera and a couple of other uh, gadgets, uh, he built himself this machine. I'm not sure. All right. So you, you, I'm going to leave you with some homework. Um, after this, you can go to YouTube and watch the cucumber sorter in action. It's quite amazing. Um, and uh, there you go. He classifies cucumber into his nine categories. Uh, the training set was not very large, so there is some indication that the model is uh, overfitting a little bit. Still, it's very nice that someone can do this. Um, classifying cucumbers uh, is uh, fundamentally computing a function, right? Uh, it's not written in your favorite functional language, but that's what it's doing. Um, in the last part of the talk, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about some applications of deep learning and of TensorFlow that go beyond functions. And uh, some of them are about training your networks to generate content. Uh, for example, David Ha has been using TensorFlow for generating, I'm told, realistic looking uh, but fake uh, kanji characters to which he gives uh, whimsical interpretations. Um, uh, other applications are for uh, learning for groups of agents that cooperate and compete. And uh, in what remains of my time, I will tell you a little bit about one such application, this uh, recent work on neural cryptography. The question that we want to uh, address is whether we can learn cryptography or secure communication given only an end-to-end -end specification of the behavior of a system. This is very much like standard program synthesis, but in some respects it may be more ambitious because secure is not a functional property. Imagine that we have two neural networks, Alice and Bob. Alice receives a plain text P, produces uh, something C, which we think of as a cipher text, that Bob then processes and produces his best guess as to the value of P, trying to recover exactly P. And uh, the requirement on this is that Bob should get the right value of P, but also that uh, no eavesdropper can extract P from this uh, message uh, C. So the requirement is confidentiality, not uh, integrity. One approach might be to hard code some particular crypto system into Alice and Bob, or we might train them to do some uh, particular crypto system. But what we really like to find out is if we can teach uh, Alice and Bob um, to uh, invent a crypto system of their own or to discover the need for cryptography, can we make them cooperate to discover a solution to this puzzle? One way to do that is to introduce explicitly a third neural network that we're going to call Eve that is also trying to recover the plain text uh, P because 
P is a neural network, we're not going to get uh, a strong security theorem against uh, all polynomial time Turing machines or anything of the sort. We're going to get protection only against some uh, small class or larger class of neural networks. Still, in some applications, I think that's uh, quite remarkable and quite interesting, even if we can get this far. In particular, for some applications, the adversary is, in fact, a neural network. There's recently been papers, for example, on using neural networks for breaking passwords. Or we may ourselves have a system with several neural networks, and for whatever reason, privacy or something else, we might uh, want to make sure that some component of our system does not look at some features or some aspect of the input data. And uh, this approach might be one way of guaranteeing that. In order to give uh, Alice and Bob a fighting chance, we give them an additional input, namely a key K that goes to both of them. So this is uh, going to go in the direction of uh, shared key or symmetric key cryptography. We have also done some experiments with public key cryptography, which I will not have time to uh, show you. And uh, we do it uh, adversarially. Alice and Bob have one objective, namely to minimize the distance between the plain text P and what Bob computes, P Bob, and to maximize the distance between the plain text P and what Eve computes, while Eve has a different objective, namely to minimize the distance between P and uh, its output, P Eve. So uh, this is quite different from uh, some of the neural network setups that you saw in the previous part of the talk, where there was a single loss function uh, of interest, and the point of training was to work with respect to that single loss function. Uh, uh, here, it's important to be able to support multiple loss functions in the same system, and uh, TensorFlow, of course, uh, is able to do that. Uh, a slight improvement uh, that is quite important in practice is uh, not to get too ambitious in defining the loss function for Alice and Bob. Uh, Alice and Bob might like it to be the case that Eve is wrong on every single bit of the input. But that's not a realistic goal, because even if Eve was guessing at random, it would get about half the bits right if the inputs are uniformly distributed. And by making Alice and Bob be so greedy and ambitious, they might get really good at defeating one particular Eve, but then another Eve comes along and uh, breaks their crypto system. A more realistic goal and one that is more likely to lead to robust solutions is to uh, have Eve be wrong about as much as it would be if, as if it was guessing at random. So we might allow Eve to get half the bits right, or perhaps a little bit more. Um, we certainly don't want Eve to get uh, all the bits right, and we're not going to work very hard to try to get e all the bits wrong. So uh, to turn these ideas into TensorFlow, what do we need to do? Well, we define the loss functions precisely. And there is a little bit of hackery and uh, engineering and a bit of black magic in picking the exact coefficients for these loss functions. In particular, Alice and Bob are trying to do two things at once, and we need to decide how much we care about one versus the other. Then we have to pick a specific neural network architecture, exactly what we use, uh, how many neurons, and how they're organized, and how they're connected. And we try to be very agnostic there. We are trying not to hardwire <laughs> a particular crypto system. We're trying to let Alice and Bob decide which connections are useful. So we use uh, a neural network with lots of connections. And then uh, we translate this design to TensorFlow code, and we train. And um, we don't train Alice and Bob first all the way, and then Eve all the way, or the other way around. What we do is a bit more game-like. We train uh, Alice and Bob for a bit, then Eve for a bit, and we go back and forth. Um, the alternation schedule that we ended up picking is uh, one mini batch of examples for Alice and Bob, two mini batches for uh, Eve, where a mini batch is some group of uh, entries, some group of examples, and we experimented with different mini batch sizes uh, up to 4,096 entries. The bigger mini batch sizes have been giving us more robust results. 
Uh, we also pick uh, plain text and key sizes, uh, nothing huge, just enough to experiment up to 64 bits. And basically, uh, nothing changes very much as we change the key size. And uh, we pick a learning rate and a few other so-called hyperparameters. And uh, we do this for a while, and we stop when Alice and Bob seem to be confusing Eve well enough. And then, just to make sure that our solution is robust, we throw away the current Eve and train a few more Eves from scratch to try to break the current uh, configuration of Alice and Bob. Occasionally, these fresh Eves succeed, and then we throw out the resulting Alice and Bobs. If uh, they don't succeed, we decide that Alice and Bob have discovered something that's uh, robust. So uh, as you can see, this is not a security theorem. It still works uh, quite well. And uh, this is uh, an example of the kinds of uh, graphs that we get uh, by doing these experiments. You can see that uh, here we are training on uh, plain text and keys that are all 16 bits long, so not very long. Um, initially, um, Bob and Eve are wrong on eight of the bits, so they're basically clueless. And um, after about, uh, what is it? Um, seven, eight thousand steps, uh, Bob is beginning to understand Alice. Somehow they have begun to communicate. But wait, Eve is catching on, and Eve is understanding their secret communication language. But after a while, something happens, and uh, Alice and Bob discover some other method for communicating around iteration 14,000 or so that allows them to uh, hide their messages uh, from Eve. So Eve's uh, loss goes back up, and Eve uh, only gets about um, eight and a half or nine of the bits right out of 16. We allow Eve to get a little bit lucky. Uh, we don't drive the error of Eve all the way down to uh, eight, um, or all the way up to eight, um, uh, because we uh, use a quadratic term in the loss function that uh, really penalizes Alice and Bob a lot if Eve understands a lot of their messages and doesn't penalize them very much if Eve gets a little bit lucky. In our experience so far, this uh, makes the training go uh, a little bit more smoothly. Um, it remains to be seen how much further we can drive uh, Eve's uh, error. There is uh, obviously a lot more experiment that one can do in this direction, and we have done uh, some of them. A final comment about this graph is that this is not uh, a typical graph for training neural networks. Typically, uh, when one trains neural networks, uh, there is a smooth uh, progression of the learning. Here, this looks much more like a graph for some kind of uh, biological system that is evolving, where some big events uh, happen and earthquakes uh, change continents and whatnot, and eventually we get into a steady state. So uh, to finish, um, as you can see, the use of machine learning and of neural networks in particular is uh, advancing very rapidly and very successfully at the moment. Um, deep learning in, in particular has uh, really uh, changed the game in the last uh, few years. And uh, although it is perhaps a kind of uh, functional computation, it also has some uh, new, very intriguing, and I think still mysterious elements. And research continues in many directions. TensorFlow, with its very uh, simple model for data flow computation, provides the flexibility to uh, experiment with many different approaches to deep learning and to realize it uh, in production at uh, great scale. Um, I'll leave you with uh, a pointer to TensorFlow.org where there are some documentation, some tutorials. Uh, in a few weeks, there will be a paper that we're going to publish in OSDI. There is also a really nice uh, playground. That's an environment that you can run uh, inside your browser once you have a Wi-Fi connection that allows you to, <laughs> that allows you to uh, play around with neural networks um, and understand a little bit of how they work. Uh, I also leave you with a pointer to the web pages for the Brain Team. Uh, in particular, the Brain Team has a residency program. Uh, residents come for uh, about one year. It's a great program, and the application deadline uh, is uh, coming up. So, th thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions.
Um, so let me repeat the question since you were not uh, mic'd. So the question is, uh, from a cryptography perspective, is it possible to analyze the thing that Alice and Bob discovered? And um, what we thought they might discover is some variant of the one-time pad. After all, we get them enough key material. And some of the properties of what they do does seem to have some of that because uh, we can look at how their behavior changes when we change one bit of one thing or one bit of another. Uh, we didn't push it enough to figure out exactly what it is. It is not just XOR. It's doing something else. It's mixing bits in some more interesting ways. Yeah. Sorry, um, a question from someone who really has no appreciation. Sorry, I really don't know much. Um, in your opinion, is the deep learning, is it more similar to superficial copying and parroting what, what, what people do, or is it closer to actually human understanding? I, I, I'll rephrase your question, not because you didn't have a microphone, but because I, I'd like to have a question I'd like to be, I'd be able to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so the, I, I guess the question is something like, uh, is deep learning replicating the intelligence of humans, or is it giving new understanding that hu we humans don't yet have? And to, to a large extent, many of the tasks for which deep learning has been used are things for which we humans are quite good but have not systematized into programs yet, for example, translating across languages or recognizing cuts from dogs or sorting cucumbers. But occasionally there is uh, things that deep learning has been able to do that no human had done before where clearly there is some new insight. And uh, the example that comes to mind is the uh, AlphaGo program uh, who found some uh, really new, apparently interesting and novel ways of uh, doing Go moves that uh, great Go players had not really expected before. Yeah. So, hello. So uh, you, you mentioned before that at the, be the beginning of your talk that you basically have a, uh, um, you, a differentiable representation of a function, and then you do gradient descent on it. Um, so I wondered if you had, if you've considered like something like linear logic as a type system for that, so because you can get things like differentiable linear logic due to the, you know, the the vector space representations of linear logic. Um, so, in short, I don't know very much about what can be done with linear logic. The thought crossed my mind, and I discussed it with a couple of people, that there might be some connection to differentiable lambda calculus and the works of Thomas Hirard and those people, but I haven't yet found uh, some way in which that would shed new light on the subject. I would love to figure that out. Um, it's called TensorFlow. Is it just because it's a cool name, or do you actually use any properties of tensors apart from being multidimensional arrays? Like, do you use tensor products or something? So, so it's called TensorFlow. Um, we, by tensor, we just mean an n-dimensional array. TensorFlow also has a nice property that people who worked on TensorFlow are TensorFlowers or TensorFlowers, which is quite nice. <laughs> Is there anything like a library or package management for neural networks that you can piece bigger neural networks from together from working smaller ones that can? Um... There's uh, a variety of high-level APIs for neural networks, including for TensorFlow, that enable you to describe neural networks at a slightly more abstract level than just a graph of neurons. For example, there might be uh, a component that represents a whole connected layer of neurons parameterized by its size. So, so yes, there are things in that go in that direction. I got quite curious about when you said about these uh, networks where you have these conditionals and you make some decision, although you don't know what the conditional is. Can you explain more about how, do, how you get then the resulting information based on the other ones? I'm sorry, I don't think I understood the question. I think it's about uh, the implementation of conditionals, is that right? Uh, 
So you had this example of that you have some nodes where there are some conditionals in it, and depending on the condition, uh, you make some decision and you said somehow that even so you don't know the, con the condition, the, the Boolean value yet. Okay, I, I think you're referring to the fact that given a graph that contains a conditional, uh, we want to define another graph that defines the gradient of that conditional. And at graph creation time, we have not yet executed the Boolean of the first conditional. So the gradient code uh, itself will need to uh, have access to the guard of that first conditional. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, in an in earlier example, you mentioned that there is a neural network of uh, six million uh, neurons. So how is the process, how does one usually design and generate this kind of networks? And do you think uh, functional language is good for uh, specifying and generating this kind of networks? Uh, uh, so, uh, the, the question is, uh, how does one uh, describe these neural networks? I didn't get exactly how many neurons you said, um, but basically the neurons are organized uh, into big units, whole layers of neurons that work uh, in parallel over uh, the, the inputs or over intermediate values. And uh, often neural networks are described in terms of compositions of these layers. And sometimes several layers are composed together into a bigger block um, all of this kind of functional composition is, of course, very nicely supported by um, fairly functional uh, ways of expressing. At the moment, the high-level uh, libraries for assembling neural networks are not based on uh, any particular functional language that we know, but we ha they have a very functional uh, flavor to them. Hi. Um, so are you using reverse automatic differentiation, or are you symbolically calculating the, the gradient function around the placeholder? I, I didn't see who asked the question. Ah, OK. <laughs> so do, I, do we use automatic differentiation? It's a kind reverse. of automatic differentiation. Um, yes? Reverse automatic differentiation. Uh, typically, yes, though one can do either. But the main one is reverse. use communication times and memories. So does the various components of TensorFlow knows what amount of resources they take and how this is systematized? Or do we have to specify them manually? To what so um, the question is about resource usage and resource monitoring, I guess. And TensorFlow uh, aims to do, make an efficient use of resources. And uh, for example, uh, some of the placement decisions uh, can be done automatically. Uh, the user, uh, particularly expert users, uh, sometimes uh, know more than the system and uh, add uh, specific directives for where to run a particular computation. And uh, there is obviously a lot more that we could do in that direction. Thank you. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you.